Well, it's a delight to be with you uh, this beautiful spring morning. Um, and my topic is uh, wisdom for emerging adults. And so I thought I would begin by asking uh, for a show of hands, um, how many of you consider yourselves to be adults? All right, so maybe a quarter of the student body, um, just seniors, right? Our adults, I'm not sure why only uh, a small percentage of the faculty and staff raised their hand uh, as being adults. Um, but in any case, it's, it really is a, a trick question uh, because adulthood is increasingly, I think, a pretty hard thing to define. Um, and the best way I can demonstrate this, I think, is by showing you the definitive illustration of adulthood in American culture, which is the game of life. <laughs> Created in 1960, uh, life actually begins with the adult life, with the choice to go to college or to begin a career. And after getting your job, the life becomes fairly scripted. Uh, within a turn or two, everyone stops at the church to get married. Another role leads to a house purchase. And then come the pink and the blue children um, that populate your vehicle as you travel down life's highway. Uh, the script is clear. Higher education, career, marriage, a house, parenting, all taking place fairly early in the adult journey. Compare this now with the 2007 version of the game um, that's called Life Twists and Turns. <laughs> Note the tagline, a thousand different ways to live your life. You choose. And the board no longer consists of linear movement. Instead, it now has four loops. Earn it for making money. Learn it for higher education. Live it for things like climbing Mount Everest, uh, and love it for relationships of all kinds. One must determine time and time again, and in no particular order, which loop to enter. And you win not by doing well within a prescribed script, but by earning the most life points uh, in whatever experiences you choose to take part in. This is the new adulthood, um, a time of never-ending buffet of possibilities with no clear direction and all paths open to you. It's a life continually asking the question that was Microsoft's ad campaign, where do you want to go today? And with so many options, what's going to determine how you navigate the adult life? What will determine whether the Christian worldview that you develop at Wheaton will become your adult way of life as you step out into a world of jobs and relationships, of singleness or marriage, of finances and faith and struggle? And I would say that the answer to that question is actually very closely related to another question. As you enter adulthood, what are you learning to love? Jamie Smith at Calvin College has suggested that we are all lovers at our core, people whose lives are oriented by our desires, by our loves, by what we worship. And Tim Keller has said that our souls are like two empty arms looking for something to embrace. So the most important questions, right, that we can be asking in our emerging adulthood is not just what am I learning to know or what am I learning to do, but what am I learning to love? What's becoming my treasure, my reward, my deepest dream, my happily ever after? The answer to these questions is likely to be the best predictor of your long-term faithfulness, of your decision to either dig in and deepen your commitment to Christ or to begin wandering and drifting because we live for what we love. And the answer to those questions are easy at Wheaton. If I were to ask you what you should love the best, and I apologize for using the word should for Chaplain Blackman, um, almost all of you will give the right answer. It's the answer that many of you learned in Sunday school and have been reciting for your whole lives. But is it possible that you can be learning a Christian worldview while your hearts and your imaginations are being captured by something else? Could it be that your imaginations are, are digging into a different kind of love? And this is why worldview doesn't always become way of life. Because though you develop an accurate knowledge of God and of his kingdom, our loves and our affections can be swept away. And maybe we don't even recognize it uh, because we continue to profess our beliefs even as our hearts are lured away. Why does this happen so readily as we move into adulthood? And I think part of it may have something to do with the way we think about preparing for our future adult lives. 
When I was at Wheaton, um, as a student, I had dreams of who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do someday. Um, I envisioned an adult life sold out to Christ, uh, being a man of prayer, someone who contagiously shared the gospel, raising up a family to serve the Lord, and living out my vocation for kingdom purposes. And I even remember writing these ideals down in a notebook as my godly man profile, I called it, my GMP, a list of qualities that I wanted to be true of my adult life. Um, Yet in my case, uh, those dreams were pretty disconnected from my life as a student. Life was really busy with academics and with sports and with things that got very immediate rewards. And life was unstable, um, shifting relationships, I was moving every year, uh, changing career paths and ideas. Life felt very much, as I'm sure it does for you, like a perpetual temporary, everything in continual flux. Um, so my mentality was this, later, when I finally get established in a job and maybe in a relationship, when I'm less busy and when I'm living somewhere for more than a year at a time, then I will start living into my dreams. Many of my sentences in those days started with, when I'm done with college and finally have some time, or when I finally get married and settled, someday uh, was my refrain. And my sense was that I could just flip a switch when I got to my late 20s and find that the qualities that I had dreamed about would be there waiting for me. I imagined that future me would be able to live instantly into all the things that present me had envisioned. And I assumed that many of the negative qualities of my life would be quickly extinguished when I reached my adult years. Whatever happened in my early 20s would stay in my early 20s, um, and I would just begin living into my dream. Well, I've learned a couple of hard lessons. Um, first, as someone who is now squarely in midlife, I want to let you in on a very dark secret. <laughs> settled is a myth. I'm still waiting uh, for the time when life will finally get settled, opening up these vast quantities of time and space. And what's crazy is that I, I keep thinking this way. So it used to be once I'm done at Wheaton, then it was once I'm done with grad school, then it was once I get that job and get settled, uh, then it was once my kids are out of this preschool phase um, and I have some rhythm to my life, and now very often it's once I get my parents settled um, and in a good place. It's taken me a really long time uh, to learn the truth. Uh, that mythical someday of a settled life never comes. And we can spend our whole lives waiting for that elusive future in which we will really begin living into the dreams that we're learning about now. But second, that someday mentality is so dangerous because while you're waiting for that future, your loves are being formed in the present. And they may be formed in ways that are slowly moving you farther and farther away from the dream that you now profess. Back when I was young, one of my favorite toys uh, was an Etch-a-Sketch, an ancient device with two knobs on the bottom that would allow you to draw vertical and horizontal lines on a screen. And if you were really good and could do them both at the same time, you could get a diagonal line as well. But to me, the Etch-a-Sketch was magical because you could do whatever you wanted on the screen and then just shake to erase. And the lines on the screen would instantly disappear so that you could start over. I think I saw my college years and my 20s as a kind of Etch-a-Sketch with a clear sense that the responsibilities of adulthood were coming um, this was a limited window of freedom and exploration where I could draw whatever I wanted on the screen and then just shake to erase when I reached age 30 or got married, um, starting over with a clean slate. Yet I failed to recognize one important point. Each Etch-a-Sketch drawing would leave a subtle trace that would become more visible and more directional over time, forming grooves in the screen that began to shape future drawings in certain paths. And this actually happened to my own Etch-a-Sketch, where after a while I could only draw Spider-Man, um, because that's where the grooves on the screen had come, and so all new lines would naturally fall into those places. You see, when it comes to the formation of our loves and our desires, we need to have, in emerging adulthood, a harvest mentality. Galatians 6 utilizes agricultural imagery for this process. It says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit from that spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
The images here speak to the gradual process by which the sowing of seed leads to a harvest. So why does it say don't be deceived? I think part of it is because of the time that's in between the sowing and the reaping. Sowing to please the sinful nature doesn't always produce its negative fruit quickly. And so we may be deceived into thinking that a life given over to sinful pleasure has little impact on our future faithfulness. But the lack of visible decline cannot erase the subtle decay that is beginning to gradually reshape the heart's loves and affections. The absence of observable fruit doesn't mean the seed is dormant, just that the poisonous growth is happening beneath the soil, beneath conscious awareness. So the problem with this idea that, getting, that using the 20s as a time to get your sinful passions worked out of your systems is that engagement in these passions tends to do the opposite. It works these things into our systems in such a way that will be challenging to remove later on. For sin is not just a momentary failure of the will, it actually begins to weaken the will. It weakens the mind so that we're less likely to think correctly and more likely to rationalize. It weakens the emotions even so that we feel less and less satisfied with sin and maybe less shocked by it as well. Scripture often speaks of the calloused heart um, that has been hardened over time and lost all sensitivity. And our habitual life patterns are actually producing, biologists tell us, real changes in the brain, forming grooves in our neural pathways that facilitate repetition. We grow more and more likely to choose these paths, and they become part of the fabric of our lives. And so this is the kind of freedom that begins to lead to a kind of enslavement. Um, so while it's tempting to argue with ourselves, and I know I did, uh, certainly, that we can either shake to erase or flip a switch, to become that godly man or woman of our dreams in the future. The reality is that by the time that future arrives, that adult man or woman may no longer even possess the will or the desire to make a change because our loves have been reshaped and have been reoriented. In other words, by the time you get to 30, the dream of your early 20s may not even be your dream anymore. This is why we're called in Hebrews 3.13, I think, to encourage one another, not someday, but today, so that you will not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. In my college days, my dreams of becoming a prayer warrior and a contagious Christian did not often translate into the work of developing daily practices of prayer or seeking out contact with nonbelievers. That was my future life. Um, and my hopes for a future vocation rarely made me think that I should live my student vocation intentionally in that way. My dream of being a great husband and father didn't always translate into healthy relational patterns on campus. And when I got to age 30, I think I was a little shocked to discover that I wasn't all that I had dreamed that I would be. What I found was that professor me was a whole lot like student me, uh, just with a job title and an office. And I had always thought that marriage would completely change my nature. Uh, you hear that all the time, I think, right? But I found that married me was a whole lot like single me, uh, just with a ring on my finger and now with another person that had to live with me. Um, and I'm very grateful for her patience and for the slow work of the spirit uh, that he has done in my life. But I think what was most frightening to me was that I didn't even always desire those earlier dreams uh, that I had had. So the right kind of dreaming that takes place in emerging adulthood is the kind that leads you into a passion for living the dream uh, right now. So as your friends are sharing with you their hopes and their dreams for the future, your job um, is to tell them, that's awesome. Um, now how are we going to start living the dream <laughs> here at Wheaton? How are we going to start beginning to walk the path uh, that we dream about someday? And this is so important in part because our culture, in our culture, love is a battlefield. <laughs> the activities we engage in, uh, the media we consume, the devices we use, the websites that we frequent, they're all shaping our loves day by day, instilling within us competing dreams that are meant to capture our imaginations. So if you watch TV commercials, uh, for example, um, if it's X body spray, you get the romantic dream. Um, if it's a financial firm, you get that sort of safe and secure future dream. Um, if it's Apple, you get the dream of a family that now loves each other because you made the perfect holiday video um, of memories on your phone. Um, Apple doesn't sell features usually in its commercials. What it's selling is an alluring story of the good life um, that's trying to elicit your heart's desires. 
It's providing quite literally a call to worship. So our daily practices and routines are not just things that we do, they're doing something to us. They're forming our loves and our inclinations in ways that are powerful. And they're powerful in part because they're hidden within the natural normal flow of our lives. In recent days, I've been asking myself a new question. Where is my body taking my heart? And it might be a question that you can ask on a regular basis. Where is my body taking my heart? Do we recognize the ways that our dreams are being shaped by our everyday practices and by the stories of the good life that we're internalizing on a regular basis? And if your loves are shaped by those practices, then the reshaping of your loves will typically require countercultural practices of some kind that are drawing your affections back to Christ. False loves can't just be rejected, they have to be replaced by a greater love. The best antidote to these false loves is not just willpower, but worship. So when you're bombarded on all sides by the competing loves of this world, Christian practices are central for recalibrating the heart. Aquinas once put it this way, love is born of an earnest consideration of the thing that is loved. What do you give your earnest consideration to? Are we silent before him? Are we immersed in his word and in prayer and in worship and in remembering the good things that he's done in our lives? Are we creating regular space for the Holy Spirit to kindle those loves for Jesus? The problem here is that just as sometimes we don't believe that sowing to the flesh actually produces negative fruit, we sometimes really don't believe that sowing to the spirit is developing this positive fruit uh, because we don't often see it immediately. How many times have you begun engaging in certain disciplines and thought to yourself, I'm not changing. I don't feel any different. Why should I even keep this up? And in a world of instant gratification, the slow and the patient cultivation of the soul can seem really unrewarding. Uh, but we be must believe that the spirit is at work, growing very gradual fruit over years and decades in our lives. And this, by the way, raises the stakes uh, for why regular participation in a local church is one of the most important adult commitments that you can make. I think it's easy to feel like, well, can't we just listen to a Tim Keller podcast and some Hillsong and call it a day? Um, but when we're called to worship by other gods throughout the week, gods of success and of productivity, of physical beauty, we need desperately the practices of word and sacrament to repeatedly return us to our first love. And we need the protection of pastors and of elders, and I would even say of church membership, as a communal safeguard to protect our loves from the deceitful schemes of the world, the flesh, and the devil. We desperately need older Christians as well in our lives. Um, David Kinneman has said that most emerging adults have never had an adult friend other than their parents. And this is a problem, I think, because adulthood, if we're honest, is always plagiarized. Um, and I'm using that in a, in a positive way. We like to think of ourselves as self-created, but we are really imitators of those around us who we admire and who we esteem. We learn to love by watching what others love and walking in similar paths. And so one of the greatest gifts that you can receive in the church are older church members who can show you a visible case study of spiritual formation over time, um, where many present moments over years have developed loves that have built an adult life um, that we can seek to emulate. So our loves will go a long way, I think, to determining our adult paths because you live for what you love. But this is also true because you, you will die for what you love. And I think the Christian life is a call, especially in adulthood, to die daily. So while adulthood is often defined in our culture as self-determination, I can do whatever I want in the loops of life, um, our call is actually to be a living sacrifice, to give up the rights to ourselves and to embrace the cost of discipleship, which may be costs to reputation, to relationships, to comforts, to career aspirations, to sexual gratification. The costs are high, um, and you will only be willing, I think, to pay that cost if you believe that the reward is even higher. If your loves have been so captured by the beauty of Christ, that the cost may seem small by comparison. And my favorite expression of this, and as we begin coming to a close, uh, comes from Jesus' parable in Matthew 13. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, it says, is like a treasure hidden in a field, 
When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. When my children were young, uh, one of our favorite Bible story books was a little book of parables called Stories Jesus Told by Nick Butterworth and Mick Inkpen. I'm not actually sure if that's their real names or not, but that was, that was what was listed on the front. And my kid's favorite story was the retelling of the story of the merchant and the pearl. So let me tell you a story um, as we're coming to a close. And it is British, so you'll see some slightly different spellings of words um, as we go. So I think it'll be up on the screen uh, here. Here's a man who buys and sells things. He is called a merchant. He has a fine fur coat and a felt hat with a floppy feather. It is his favorite. The house he lives in is huge. It has five floors and a fish pond with a fountain in the front garden. The merchant has everything he wants. He has 15 rooms filled with furniture. He has four freezers full of food and three fridges for fizzy drinks. Uh, that was my, my kid's favorite uh, screen. Um, and there's more money under his mattress than you could imagine, much more. Yes, the merchant has everything he wants until one day, in a shop window, he sees something, something special. It is a wonderful white pearl. 500,000 pounds, says the man in the shop, about a million dollars. It's even more money than the merchant has under his mattress, but he wants that pearl more than anything in the world. So he hurries home, he has a plan. He sells his furniture, his fridges, and his freezers full of food. He sells his house, his fountain, and his fish pond which was deeply distressing to my daughter who loves animals. Um, he sells his fine fur coat, but the felt hat with the floppy feather he keeps. It is his favorite. He borrows a barrow and bundles in the money. Off to the shop he trundles to buy the pearl. Oh dear, he is still six pounds short. Sell me your hat for six pounds, says the man in the shop. The merchant laughs. He hands the man his hat and takes the pearl. Hooray, the pearl is his at last. Jesus says God is like the merchant's pearl. It cost everything to know him, but he is worth more than anything in the world. And you see this as he goes off, clicking his heels with his, uh, down to his underwear, uh, holding the pearl in his hands. The reason I think I love this retelling of this story is that it tells the truth about the cost of discipleship. Um, this wealthy merchant is willing to give up everything for the pearl, except originally for that felt hat, right, with the floppy feather, uh, which is his favorite. So I wonder, what, what is your felt hat? What is that love, that treasure, that dream that's so powerful in you that you clutch onto it with everything that you have, and maybe even believe that life is not worth living without it? We all have these things in our lives, but when the merchant is asked to turn over the hat, I've always been so taken by his response because it says that he laughed. In Matthew 13, it says that when the man found the treasure buried in the field, in his joy, it says he went and he sold everything he had to buy that field. The only way this is possible is if you are so captivated by the treasure, by the pearl, that the cost is worth it. You give up everything because you know that you are gaining so much more. And in adulthood, you will be asked to give up some things for other things. And those decisions will be shaped by what you're really learning to love. Some in Jesus' day considered the price too high. The rich young ruler was asked to sell everything to gain treasure in heaven. But he went away sad, the text tells us, because he had great wealth. His loves had been shaped in such a way that he saw his riches as more beautiful, more lovely than heavenly treasure, than Christ himself. And so the cost wasn't worth it to him. And in John 6, many who heard Jesus' teaching counted the cost and determined it was too high. This is hard teaching, they said. Who can accept it? And so they left. Jesus then turned to his disciples and asked really the question, you don't want to leave too, do you? It's a question that he asks all of us, really, um, and some answer it by walking away, um, walking away maybe after Wheaton as you move into adulthood. But when Jesus asks us of Peter, his answer is different, and it's beautiful. 
Lord, he said, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, Peter's loves had been formed in such a way that the cost seemed small when placed alongside the beauty of his savior. He had already experienced costs and he would experience many more in the years to come, but he knew what he had. Uh, he had the pearl. So do you know what you have? Um, as you enter adulthood, have you found the pearl? And are you living with him ever before your eyes so that you fall more and more deeply in love with him and begin to recognize the false imitations that are offered to you? So can you say with Paul, I consider everything a loss, everything compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, garbage, that I may gain Christ. When this happens, our adulthood begins to be shaped, not by Microsoft's question, where do I wanna to go today? But instead by Peter's, where else would I go? Um, he holds the words of eternal and abundant life. Amen.